and I want to welcome everyone to this Adami Talks session 2020. Adami Talks, uh, we already had in the last years, for example, on the topic of fake news and uh, on how important it is to choose the media uh, that you get information from. And of course, it's also very important for you as upcoming journalists or filmmakers that right now are studying at media fac faculties to be aware what kind of media outlets are there and what kind of media outlets bring what kind of information. Today, we want to talk a little bit about the positive idea. We want to talk about the impact, about the ideas, what can we do? I would like to pass the word to George Shevashidze, Tbilisi State University. Uh, George, I welcome you and thank you. Please uh, give us a short greeting to the audience. Thank you, Stefan. It's, my re it's really my pleasure to greet you on behalf of Tbilisi State University, of our students and the whole academic community of Tbilisi State University. As you already mentioned, it's really misfortune that we cannot meet in person. But we was preparing ourselves to greet you all in Tbilisi and organize uh, Adami's talk in a different manner. But unfortunately, we have to move to uh, online uh, online option. I can see a couple of representatives of Media College already connected to your talks. And I uh, wish that uh, all of them will learn a lot from very interesting discussions. And I wish you a very interesting uh, discussion, very interesting session today, and hope that one day we will host you as usual. Thank you very much. And I would like to pass on the word uh, to the ambassador of the Republic of Germany in Georgia, uh, Mr. Hubert Knirsch. Uh, and uh, Hubert, please, maybe you want to say a couple of words to our students at the different universities. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan, and I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to open Adami Talks uh, here together with you, together with Rector George Schawaschitze and uh, my dear colleague Maike, the ambassador of, of the Netherlands. Adami specifically is about this region, about uh, Eastern Europe and the stories of Eastern Europe need to be told. This is not a, a gray region, it is a very colorful region in which the identities and the culture, cultures exist very closely uh, together. A region that is Europe and should be more conscious about it. A region full of challenges, of course, where there are constantly temptations and attempts to uh, create culture wars. And this is also visible in, in the media. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Panelists will be. Uh, Udo Livischkis from Cologne. He is the senior correspondent uh, from WDR and has a lot of experience in all the countries of the former Soviet Union because he was based in Moscow and covering all the countries of the former Soviet space uh, and uh, working for ARD, the biggest broadcast or the biggest channel which we have in Germany. We have uh, Maggie de Koning uh, with us, uh, who I know because she's from my field, from the documentary field, that's, that's her world, like mine, uh, documentary filmmaking. And she has changed and switched from a broadcaster to a very interesting film festival, which is in The Hague in the Netherlands, and it's called Movies That Matter. So exactly the topic that we are talking about, making movies that really make an impact, that really change something. And I'm very happy that Maggie is uh, with us today from Amsterdam, from the Netherlands. And we have uh, Mike Charlton with us, uh, a filmmaker, producer, who has a totally different story, uh, coming from Australia, uh, grown up in, in England, based in Dubai, right now living in Tbilisi, uh, having been in all kinds of crisis areas, working as a DOP, as an editor, as a producer. So a lot of experience ahead. So Mike will also join us uh, in telling us a little bit more uh, about um, this story. Uh, do we have an impact? Can we change something? This is really a question. I'm really interested to listen a little bit more information from you. Udo, please. Yeah, thanks, Stefan. Hello, everybody. Um, it's a real honor to take part in this discussion here. It's a vast topic. I mean, what is a good documentary? Can it change something? I mean, we could talk days about that. So allow me to do it a little bit more personal and just talk about my, my personal experience. In general, I would be rather skeptical, but you normally get back after you made some, some nice letters from viewers, uh, some praise from the editors, and 
but it all depends obviously from what film are you doing, how relevant it is. This is uh, to me a very important topic. I come, I started my career working for consumer shows. That means uh, we showed people uh, how they were cheated by big corporations, uh, by wrong advertisement and so on. Uh, and that was super successful because people first time realized, oh wow, they really helped me. They, they tried to, to avoid being cheated and that was great. And that went on in my career. So when I was then working as a correspondent 25 years, I really took this position and I looked from the angle of the week. So that's for me a very crucial uh, thing to decide if a film or documentary is good or not. It should show the problems of weak people and not reflect the uh, positions of government uh, and, and powerful uh, groups in society. So relevance is very important. Do not bore. It's also very, very important. I mean, the best intentions uh, are not helping you much if your film, your documentary is kind of boring. It's not really hitting the nerve of the public. And now let's come to Adami. And uh, we were sitting in, in Ljubljana and watching a lot of films. And there, was, there were many films where you could see great ideas, uh, big commitment, uh, a lot of dedication. Still, they were not always so overwhelmingly strong that we were yeah, too much impressed. And this, of course, is now the point where I get a bit timid and a bit shy and reluctant because I'm, I was in a very privileged situation working for AID. Uh, that means there was first time to work on documentaries, a long time. And that means money. So you need a little bit of resources, you need a crew, and you have to have the chance to come back to your heroes, maybe twice or three times or four times, and then a film gets gets much stronger. And I had this privilege. And the main important, main thing, the most important, as I see, is editorial freedom. You must have the right to do a critical film. And now I'm going to tell you a little fairy tale from Brussels. So before coming to Moscow, I was working in Brussels. I was this uh, relatively young, ambitious correspondent. And we started researching the corruption scandals within the European Commission. You know, that, that's the administration of, of Europe, if you want. And there were some really dramatic corruption scandals. And in the same time, my director general, Mr. Pleitgen, who was representing AID in Brussels, was fighting for a new directive. It was a big epic fight between public TV and radio and the private newspapers and private TV. And he came every week to Brussels. He even created a new uh, lobbying office in Brussels and he was schmoozing the European Commission. And now imagine, and his young correspondent Udo was trying very hard to make them angry by researching their, their corruption scandals and broadcasting it. So I was kind of the biggest possible accident this director general could face. And now, believe me or don't, he came to Brussels, so we sometimes met and had a dinner or a lunch. Not once he made the slightest remark saying, listen, Udo, come on, keep it calm a little bit, right? You can do that next year, but not now, because you are just destroying my whole uh, smoothing campaign with the European Union. He never did that. And this you have to understand, that's paradise for journalists, you know, this understanding of, of internal freedom of a TV station where the boss doesn't tell you what to do. He said, okay, you want to find their corruption, that's fine. And now let's come back a little bit to that aspect, can we influence something with a film, you know? When we finally, after five months of working hard, broadcasted this uh, big documentary in ARD, uh, in the evening program, so it was watched by many, many millions. The next morning there was a press conference in the European Commission, and I went there, of course, I was curious. And then the spokesperson of Mr. Santer, the president of this commission, said the sentence, yes, this ARD documentary yesterday, that was the best which I have seen since Leni Riefenstahl. You know, Riefenstahl was this famous uh, Nazi propagandist. And that was not meant as a compliment, obviously. But two weeks after that, the Santa Commission, in a dramatic night session, stepped back from power completely. 
because of these corruption scandals, not because of our film, obviously, but we were just a tiny part uh, showing what was going on and building pressure, uh, public pressure, so they couldn't stand anymore the, the, the step back. So that was one of these few, unfortunately, few moments where, where a film changed something, at least helped changing something. Um, look, I, I keep it short. I think we shouldn't uh, listen too much to my monologues here. Maybe we can discuss later on. Uh, we can discuss a little bit what is a good, okay, no, I, I give myself one more minute. That's very personal. There's tons of criteria. What is a good film? What is a bad film? Let's take two of my advices. Uh, I made kind of 40, 45 long films, documentaries in these 25 years of being a correspondent. What really worked were two things that I think are very, very important. One is don't go somewhere, film and, and show it, but come back, revisit your hero, try very hard as hard as you can and, and your editor allows you and your budget allows you, come back, do a long-term observation, follow people over a period of time and you will see that's fascinating. The viewers will be fascinating seeing development. I, I don't want to bore you with all my, my heroic deeds, but we followed a, a family in America with seven child. Uh, becoming homeless, and then the guy went to jail, and then he came out of jail, and they found a little flat. So at the end, it was a kind of happy end. But the fact that we followed this family for one year, it was at the West Coast, so it was not so easy to go there all the time. That was very important for the success of the film. And yes, I did, did that several times. Short, find good heroes and follow up. Go there if you can afford it. Don't drop them, don't make the film and go on to the next topic. No, follow people and show development. That's one of the things from my very personal experience. The second is try to cooperate. <clears throat> um, especially, I mean, you do that anyhow in war situations. I mean, Chechen war, remember, we always change pictures and have you that, have you got this? That's normal in extreme situations. But also when you do investigative stuff, if you want to drill deeper, try to find cooperation, other journalists from maybe other countries, uh, newspaper and the TV together, whatever. We did a film about the BSE uh, story in, in Brussels, you know, this uh, cow, mad cow disease it was called. Some criminals were selling the meat, which was supposed to be burned, selling back to the food chain. And we worked seven months. We had 12 journalists from six countries working on it. And it was a great film at the end because of this, power through cooperation. So that's one of the, the very simplistic, pragmatic tips I can give you as a, as a practical guy. I'm not so much in the theory of documentaries, but I'm just more in uh, doing them. Okay, thanks so much for the, your patience and let's wait for the discussion. Uh, I want to know what are the um, like, what are the major differences between filming in Moscow in um, Washington, and I'm, I mean, like in general. Oh, I know God. it's yeah, a that's, very that's general good. question. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it is very general. Okay, in Europe, of course, it's more you, you do more research uh, by 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 phone, by by figuring out political things. Brussels was something like this. You had endless lunches with bureaucrats from the European uh, Union. In Moscow, you get more cold feet. You travel far to remote regions. Uh, working in a country like like uh, former Soviet Union means also you look for more exotic things like like whatever cold stories and uh, but I focus also on uh, critical films about the Putin government since uh, I was and I am sure that this is a, a very authoritarian government destroying the future of uh, many young Russians. I have a Russian family. Uh, a Russian wife and my kids have uh, Russian passports too. So I'm very concerned about the future of this beautiful country, which I like very much. So I was twice going there because I wanted it, not because I was pushed to go there. Uh, yes, so my task was to show what this government is doing with its own people. So I did a lot of documentaries showing the cynical, how cynical and corrupt elites are plundering uh, this country. So that was pretty um, um, investigative. We did a story about farmers in Krasnodar in the south of Russia uh, who were yeah, pressured amazingly by big agro 
corporations. And that was a big success. And once again, we followed these farmers for one year. They made demonstrations. They tried to come to Moscow to demonstrate at the Red Square. They were caught by the police, put into jail. We waited till they came out and made them tell the stories. So that, that's one of these films where we had to fly, I think, five or six times, right? And every time we, we were staying for two days or five days. Uh, and I know this is a privilege, and I feel really yeah, a bit of, bit of shame telling you that, because I imagine in the countries of Adami, the guys who are listening now, that you don't normally have these possibilities. But maybe take a small camera and take a cheap bus and go there and film anyhow try to make it uh, with a low budget. You know, it, It's really important to be at the spot when something happens. If you fly somewhere or drive somewhere and make the one interview in the living room, that's the most boring thing you can do. Uh, it's another thing. Try to make your stories spicy by dragging people out of their comfortable situations. Never do interviews at a, at a desk. Never on a couch in a living room. This is, this is worst case. Make them do something. So, sorry, uh, don't tell me, but I, I made a, an Altai family slaughter a sheep. And while they were slaughtering a sheep, I was doing the interview. That's maybe not completely fair. Maybe normally I was a bit uh, influencing reality. Maybe they would have slaughtered the sheep two days later. I said, do it today, please. And they were slaughtering the sheep. And then they gave the interview while digging in the intestines of a sheep. This is an interview. You know, then the visual is so spicy and so fascinating that people listen even to a longer sound bite. If the same guy would have been sitting in his living room where he wanted to sit originally, and he would make his blah blah in a foreign language which had to be translated, nobody would listen to that thing for longer than 30 seconds. You know what I mean? So I'm sorry when I'm spreading here this banal little trick of Udo, how to make film spicy, but yeah, that's all I can do. I'm a practical guy. I'm not a theorist of documentary. <laughs> the important thing about uh, showing someone like, or uh, if you want to show somebody's character is to uh, show them in action or in while they're doing something or not just um, uh, just record their monologues, uh, how they lived, right? Or how they leave? Look, yeah, yeah. Look, I'm just doing, a, I'm starting a kind of a little second career as a media trainer and I came across uh, a scientific um, um, thing which I didn't expect. Do you know how much of the things we memorize are cognitive? I mean, it's, it's just yes. the, the, the idea itself and how much is visual and emotion? The, the, Relation is kind of 93, think, 93 to 7 or so, right? Yes. So you don't really remember the smartest things said when they are not touching you emotionally and visuals are emotions, of course, right? So you have to get the message through emotionally. And this doesn't happen when a guy sits comfortable on his desk where he always sits and he, he tells you the smartest thing possible. No, bring him out, make him slaughter a pig, whatever. Uh, bring him into situations where he is not comfortable. I made people repair their cars while I interviewed them, you know, and then they become more natural and, and the visuals add up to that that more interesting environment. And then it might go deeper into the, the audience gets more uh, touched. I get it. Um, recently, I'm currently filming a movie and I will uh, only ask the last question about my uh, movie that I'm filming. Um, I'm filming my village. Um, Originally, I'm from a village, and I moved to uh, Tbilisi while doing my studies. So, about the village life, uh, if you ever filmed that kind of movie, it's hard to judge about your village. But I tell you what I did when I was um, planning a trip to a certain region to, to deal with the topic. I was always asking uh, my producers, mostly researched it. I said, "Will there be any wedding? Will there be any funeral? Will there be any big party?" You know, people coming together. I mean, the worst case scenario, you, because as a TV, of course, we had money, but not so much that you could wait weeks to something to happen, right? So you have two or three days when you fly for a, a seven-minute program, and uh, you cannot just wait till till the wedding happens. So you have to research all that to at least try to find some interesting moments where people people drinking alcohol and being coming together, which I don't do every day. Of course, are different people. They're in a different mood. They're more vital. They're more exchanging um, ideas. So try to figure out when something special happens. 
Thank you very much, Udo. I would like to come to our third panelist. And before we go to Amsterdam and to Nagie, maybe Maike van Koldam, the ambassador of the Netherlands here in Tbilisi, in Georgia, uh, may give us a couple of words. Thank you for being with us and thank you for supporting Adami. Well, thank you, Stefan. Thank you for giving me the floor. Our contribution is just very modest, contrary uh, to the contribution from um, the German embassy, my dear colleague uh, Hubert, indeed. But I'm happy to nevertheless uh, be here with you. It was also good to see Mr. Sharvashite, whom I met um, months ago before COVID at the Tbilisi State University. Um, I'm really happy to be here. And I think the motto, can we change the world? Do we have impact? It's a crucial uh, question to you as journalists and future journalists. But it's also a question that I ask myself on a daily basis as a diplomat, because that's also what we want to do. We want to change the world to the better by promoting universal human rights, by promoting free media, freedom of speech. As we speak, we have this conference in the Netherlands on um, the world press freedom. Um, so we try to do our best in this perspective. And I'm really happy that I get to introduce uh, Marchia. We did not yet meet in real life, but we met uh, virtually like here, and that was a very pleasant conversation. And I think uh, Movies That Matter is a great, great festival because you focus on human rights and you use the power of movies to have a debate on human rights issues, on diversity, on tolerance, on fair justice, um, because like was already said in this meeting, images sometimes speak more than words. Images, films speak directly to our hearts, to our minds. That expression, hearts and minds, is a bit of a cliche, but it is true. By watching a movie without speaking a language, you can already see what, and whether it's a pig or a sheep or something else, uh, sometimes just a face and what's going on, you can see on faces, and that's what good filmmakers um, manage to express. And then exchange of words is still very relevant because we need to um, exchange thoughts and experience from practice um, and from uh, the future filmmakers. And I'm really very happy that all of you are young students, the future generation. It's indeed up to you um, to shape the future. We are here uh, together with you and we hope to contribute in our way in a diplomatic world. Um, but we hope that also has an impact. So having said so, I think it's much more important that Marchia gets to speak. Um, so I'm handing back over to Stefan and um, we'll be delighted to listen to Marchia and to the follow-up um, questions and answer session. And I'm very happy with uh, the great stories from practice from the other um, panelists. So thank you very much. And I'm now again in the listening mode. Thank you very much. I, what I did, I prepared slightly different from the other panelists. Maybe I prepared a power presentation for you. I'm extremely clumsy uh, digital, so I hope it all will work. And before I do that, so that we don't have too much talking, I want to give you an impression of the sort of documentaries we, for instance, I selected this year for our uh, International Film Festival. It's just a slight flavor. You can always go to the website and, and understand what all the other documentaries uh, we have been selecting. So uh, Philo and me, we, we organized it this morning early technically, so I hope it will work. So first, I'd love you to show uh, the trailer of our festival so you have an idea of the different kind of films we're doing. And then um, we do a little technical transition and I'll uh, present you with a PowerPoint. So Philo, if you can show the trailer, the festival trailer, please. Thank you so much, Philo. And as you can see, um, uh, there's films from all over the world. That's what we try to give you the image. And it's it's documentary, but in this case, it's also feature films. Now I'm going to share you my screen, and I hope it's going to work, because that's always fascinating. One second. Give me one sec. Uh, 
And I'd like to start with a very personal um, thing. This has been my board for a long time in my office. And the only one who can read out what this is, is my mic, because it's all in Dutch. And this is my very chaotic, creative, clumsy mind. And that's the way I am. So let's get it more organized. The first one is the stranger in my house, which means when I was a filmmaker, and I still do that, whenever you make a film or start to make a film or have an idea for a film. For me, it has always been important that I should embrace the other, where the other is coming from, or if it's from Russia, if it's from China, if it's from the neighborhood I live in, wherever it is, it sh I should be curious about that stranger in my house. And I mean this on a very meta level, but it's always in my mind. I should always embrace the other who I do not know. And then I get curious and with me as the filmmaker or as a commissioning editor or now as a festival director, I hope the audience will get curious with me. That was the first one. The second one, it's a nice day to live. And that's the sort of films we are doing uh, in our field are very often, as, as Udo is saying, they are harsh, they are, they are uh, 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 tough, difficult, uh, they are about wars. And the reason I'm giving this is a very personal one. Um, I'm completely fine now, I will say this upfront, but I had cancer twice. So I had a huge war in my body. And the only thing, I, I used to have long brown hair now, it's like this. Uh, I always used to say and think, Whenever, if there's a war internal, you're filming a war, you're telling very hard situation, be aware if you want people to tell that story, think of the small little sparkles every day or within your film for, so people can keep up. Because if you make human rights films and you're only talk about what's really bad and what's negative and it's a harsh world, it's nearly unbearable to watch that film as it was unbearable for me to go to my process, my war in my body. So I always said every day, it was, it's a nice day to live. What was the good, what was the sparkle of the day? And bear in mind when you make tough films for me. Then the third one is from good old Desmond Tutu. And I really like this one, to forgive or to take revenge. There's always a choice, meaning within filming, I always try to search for uh, uh, not punishing anyone, but trying to see what was good and maybe forgive and so on, and how people try to do that. Our opening film, I'll just give it to you quickly, Lamentations of Judas, film set in South Africa, is an amazing example of that. So to forgive is more interesting than to take revenge. And that's always in the back of my mind. And then the last one, which is from a Danish philosopher, Lokstrup, and it's uh, a beautiful one for me as well. I am because you are. So if I don't look after you, you won't look after me and we need to look after each other. It sounds like a very simple one, but I think for me, it's a very important one to think about or to bear in my mind. And then I give you very quickly that th these, are the, th these are the two, uh, we are the programmers also for Movies That Matter, but that's very quick. And I want to do a little statement today about the whistleblower filmmakers. So the people who make these films who have huge impacts, who are highly important, but as highly important are they are, how difficult that is. So to me, they are the heroes. They show, they show the raw, raw reality of our societies around the world. They need and deserve full international support of organizations and funds. Going back to, to Udo, uh, uh, they need our money and our help in order to make these films. They can't do it on their own. I always say to everybody that I've been, as a commissioning editor uh, at the broadcast, I've been extremely fanatic about showing these films. And that's why I work for film festivals to show these films as well. And sometimes, Films need to be shown in a festival on the other end of the world in order to, in the end of the day, show the film in the country of, of, of where uh, the film is being made. I have an extremely good example of a film we did in South Africa, um, which I supported. Uh, it was about the minor strikes where 40 people were killed. The public broadcaster, SABS, did not want that the South African public broadcaster. There was no way of supporting that film. Uh, so we, I started it with an international crowd of commissioning editors and in the end of the day the pressure was so high because it won prizes all over, it won an Emmy Award, 
uh, the public broadcaster in South Africa basically had to show it, and it then changed uh, uh, a bit in the politics uh, over there. So that's a very impressive one. Think, of course, of impact or the long tail for a long period of time. That's very important. Make the film, but then think. That's really important if you make whistleblower films or it, uh, on that sort of issues. You make the film, it's in a festival, being showed, and then think about impact. Nowadays, we get more and more impact produced, but that's a really important uh, thing. Sometimes I really like cinema. I really like a good, uh, good camera work and montage and all the rest of it. It should not be boring, absolutely. But sometimes you have to take in account that the content might be more important than in the cinematographic language. I once supported a film uh, in uh, Burma and it was all made on, the, on an iPhone or on a phone. Of course, it was no other way. So it was shaky on behind of motors and everything. It won an Emmy and it wasn't the best DOP. It was, it was extremely good montage, by the way. Sometimes that's needed to get your idea across. Be aware of that. That's, sometimes you can't put your quality levels too high on that. Then you make that film, but how the hell you need support because it can be scary. It can be come to law cases. It can be, be high pressure of politicians against your film, etc., etc. And I wanted to uh, light out one group and it's called Doc Society and they have an amazing handbook called uh, Safe and Security, help filmmakers do, what can they do? They have a big uh, um, uh, human rights lawyers team and so on to help filmmakers. And some filmmakers from the Netherlands have already, and, and other countries have benefited from them a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, if it's all right, I th if, if I'm correct, Nina will put the, um, the URLs in the chat while I'm talking. There are two, this, this one and this and, uh, another one. So what they do, that you would have to look after yourself, your team, tell the story with, without getting sued for it. It's a very difficult one. Get better legal help early. So if you know you're making a film, which could, you know, we're, we're for instance now uh, uh, taking up, I mean, I set up the film. I will, I will uh, uh, show it at the festival, but it's been made now. And they're taking up the, the Nigerian widows, taking up Shell, the big, big multinational in the Netherlands. And that's very scary because Shell can at a certain point say, okay, we're gonna make it a law case. And then it's, they have millions and millions and millions. And apparently even the broadcaster doesn't have that. Then Safe and Security or Doc Society is a place where you can go with your, um, with, with your film to help you. So then the broadcaster Broadcaster for sure will help you, but you can do it together. And um, well, I'm not going through all of it because then we were losing time. But go th if you're making that kind of films, uh, go to do the book handbook of safety and security and see how you can be helped and they can help you and get inspired. And then um, there's um, a very important thing for outlet of your films. Um, what was your name, Sophia? You were talking asking that already. Um, uh, who do I need to reach? How do I reach? And very often the start of this kind of films is at film festivals, especially human rights film festivals, because they, you get a sort of protection there. And we, we are from the Netherlands uh, supporting uh, many, many film festivals all around the world, human rights film festivals. We wrote a book to set up a human rights film festival that uh, uh, I don't think you may might not need it, but there's a page and it's here in yellow uh, to talk about security and censorship, because obviously you talk about security, but we talk a lot about censorship, of course, as well. So um, if you want your film somewhere to be screened, then be informed about the law for film screenings in your country or in that country. And that and there are some more, more uh, as you can see on the dots, uh, read it out. If you, if you need that, um, check out uh, this book. It's very interesting. And this, this particular um, chapter is on um, what it means for the filmmaker if you want to show your film on a film festival, which is vulnerable in whatever way. Then, um, there's a new initiative. It's launched by Eva Fair, which is the U, which is the International Film Festival in Rotterdam, the Netherlands. Itva, I think you all know it. 
and in Berlin, the Human, the European Film Academy, and we are attached to it now as well. And we we have always been very fanatic with other international organizations. It's called Artists at Risk. And then they said it's too broad. There are at the moment in time too many filmmakers uh, at risk, and we need international uh, pressure on that. We did just did it on a filmmaker, fantastic filmmaker in Venezuela. We wrote letters, and it worked. And I give you one example. Um, from not very long ago, actually. And it's called, it's uh, Max Mit uh, Jvet. And he is a filmmaker from Belarus. And that what we then, for instance, do, it, 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 it comes to uh, then artists at risk, now filmmakers at risk. We write a letter and like we have a human rights film network with over 45 film festivals. We get the letter, we all write the same letter and, and have a huge of international uh, um, pressure on the, on in this, this, this case, the Belarusian uh, uh, parliament uh, politicians in order, this, uh, in order to, to get somebody free or to, to, to maybe help him to go to another country or something the like. So, um, I think that's highly important. And to sum it up, um, so I think it, and it works. That's why I wanted to show you this particular example. And then for the very, I'm nearly there, for the very last, I would like to say, what makes a movie matter? Choosing a subject for a film, it's highly important. It has to be a, a subject which is close to your heart because as Udo is saying, it's not a reportage. It's not you go out on a shoot, you shoot something and you go back home, you edit it. That's for the audiovisuals, that's for reporters. But documentaries, you have to stick to your, pro, to your film one year, two years, three years, four years, sometimes 10 years, whatever it takes. And it's very highly important that you choose a, a subject where you think that you can bring a unique view on and a, a new idea on, on that subject. That's extremely important. So choosing your subject, casting the right, uh, because a documentary is also about casting. It's that's not only for fiction film. Also in documentary, you 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 have an idea on the subject, and then you research and cast the right main characters. Where it's a lot of development happening, where it's not as as it was say, it's not only an interview uh, like I'm sitting now with an extremely dull background, but I'm doing that on purpose. But you should not be doing this when you're making a film. So that's highly important. Choosing your subject for the film, how close is it to your heart remember what I had what I always with have with me is the first three things what I, I showed you that's that's very important then the vision I mean every subject is basically being done that's that's not the big deal that's easy it is your vision for a documentary on that subject that's where we are interested in I'm on your shoulder and and, and through you eyes seeing a, a subject of seeing a part of the world you want to show me or a problem or whatever you would like to call it and with that goes authenticity. As a viewer, I feel if there's something set up, if it's not authentic, I feel that immediately. As and I don't, if I mean I know because I've been I I I'm married to montage rooms and editing suites. But if you're not and you're just watching a film, people feel if you have been cheating, if it's a little bit false or something like, or you have to be an extremely good filmmaker, and it's not very nice. So be authentic about your subject and your filmmaking. Style. Think about the style of your film. Don't make it dull. Get some humor in. Make sure that your DOP is interesting, or or how you want to do it. And with style, actually comes up for whom am I making the film? For people from sixty till eighty, from uh, zero till twelve, from twelve till uh, twenty. Think about for who are you making the film? Because that has an influence on the style of your film. And nowadays, it's like, do I do I attach an, 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 a, a podcast? Do I attach a, 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 a game or whatever? So, you know, think about style. And obviously, extremely important, I said it before, is the impact of your film. And think about that early on, early stages, where you're in the beginning of making the film, think about what the impact could be. Because if you, the earlier on you do that, you can write a plan and you can get money for that. Like we at Moves That Matter, we, we support uh, our activist program films and people get money for outreach, but they have to have an outreach plan. They have to know what impact do I want uh, within uh, my society with this film or something they like. So be very important about that. 
And then um, last but not least, I'd like to make a little statement on that. It doesn't matter how big or small the topic, when you, the filmmaker, believe in your film, make this happen with heart and soul, with craft shift and creativity, it always will reach audiences and maybe change a few things in this world for the better. Thank you. And then this is the, the you have our links, you can find that and thanks. That's what I always do as a little joke. And now I stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much for your attention. Magia, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I definitely will try to get a little lesson from you how to make a good presentation. <laughs> thank you really for a very interesting and nice presentation. But I would like now to switch if possible, uh, if uh, right away, right okay, now great. to my channel here in Tbilisi. So if possible, uh, can we get Mike on the screen? And then Mike, the word is, is yours. Yeah, the, the idea of today's discussion is, you know, can we change the world and what is our impact? Obviously, from my point of view, yes, we can. Um, my background has taken me to around the world and filming in a lot of different countries with a variety of subjects. And, you know, we were actually filming uh, a documentary about the international community's lack of engagement back in, um, in Bosnia and Croatia back in 1995. And we happened to be in Sarajevo when there was a shelling at the marketplace. Um, it was the second time it had been shelled. Uh, and this particular shelling left um, 40 people dead, and I think around 75 wounded. Um, and, uh, you know, we filmed the aftermath of that story and we put that out on US television. Now, there weren't many journalists in town at that time. So, you know, we were one of the few media entities, apart from a couple of the agencies um, who were there, but, you know, NATO wasn't doing anything, the international community had, had sort of you know, wash their hands of it. But as a result of this story, it must, it just hit that nerve. And as a result, um, there was a massive international backlash. It was both diplomatic, in the media, uh, militarily. And um, as a result of that story getting out, um, and it was a horrible thing to film, but it was, in as a result of that story getting out and being pushed out, um, that led to that engagement from the international community, which, down the line uh, led to the Dayton Peace Accords and that led to a peace process in Bosnia. Now that's just one small story, um, but uh, and I'd like to just move on to what I believe in terms of documentary filmmaking. Um, as Nino mentioned, the small stories have the capacity to change. And um, I, lo I loved Udo's um, uh, story as well of like, do not bore. <laughs> stories have to be interesting. Uh, as he said, do the interview over the dead sheep or make them repair the car, <laughs> but um, keep the viewer engaged. And that's a huge, um, hugely important um, part of the process. It's a, it's a story that I've, I've made that mistake. I, um, I did a documentary once about 10 years ago about groundwater depletion in India. And my mistake with that was to, um, uh, to try and tell the bigger picture rather than focusing on one Minuta, one, one personal story. And I tried to pack in a lot of personal stories about that issue. And, you know, it, it was just, it was, I mean, my, and I look back at it and think, yeah, I could have made that story. It was a one hour documentary. I could have made it 15 minutes and just chopped that one story out. So that was a, you know, it was a very personal um, lesson for me. These days, I'm a fan of, you know, the single character. And, you know, at the moment I'm working on, a couple development for a couple of documentaries that just involve one character, which is something that I very much like now. Um, and I think that it's easier to share a connection across cultures, going back to the theme of this discussion. Um, uh, you know, those personal intimate stories that open a window to larger issues. So um, yeah, and it's much easier with a single character or a small group of characters to, to portray and get get their, 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 you know, what the challenges are, what they're trying to achieve, their love, their dreams, a hope for the future, hope for their children, um, uh, and maybe show that these are barriers um, that, and not, not, I wouldn't always say barriers, but 
these are aspirations that are not constrained by barriers. They don't, they're not, um, uh, they are common to all of us uh, and not something that is defined by tribal or religious or cultural boundaries. Yes, in summing up, yes, I think we can change. Um, we can make an impact. Uh, how those stories are told is obviously very important. The stories that we choose to tell are very important, but we must choose to tell them. Can I ask a question? Uh, can everyone hear me? We're from uh, Belarus, Belarus, from Belarus. Can you hear us, dear colleagues? We're from a a, a children's uh, a TV studio projector. I'm the head of the organization of a, of a youth studio. This is an independent studio and my task was to develop social journalism in our country. And, and I believe that uh, media really uh, has this mission to make the world better. And I think this is the task of art in general. But our problem currently is uh, uh, something I want to ask you uh, some advice about and maybe some uh, support. You uh, understand, I think, the very difficult situation in our country for journalists. We really uh, wa we want to show the problems that will help youth uh, see um, the situation and, and make some uh, conclusions. For example, uh, we made a, a movie about one of the heroes who, uh, who uh, died during the demonstrations. And the father and the sister uh, drove us uh, out, and we made this very interesting and unique film because people spoke very sincerely and openly. But unfortunately, because of the difficult situation here, we left this, we had this movie uh, with, we didn't provide open access to this uh, movie because the, the, the father is a surgeon, uh, he's a, a doctor and, the, and his daughter, and we feel responsible uh, for this family. And we're afraid uh, to, to put this material out there. And our question is, how can we learn to, how can we remain, how can we present uh, information in this uh, very harsh dictatorship that uh, we have in our country? How can we bring this material to the audience that needs to see it? What is your experience? What can you share with us? Of course, this is probably a difficult question because uh, this is a choice of, of person, the matter of personal choice. Either you put it out there and just see what happens. Uh, I see that Marche wants to answer you immediately. So are you? Reacted and wanted to ask. Yeah, 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 I can do that. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, what I think could be interesting for you, for it started in the Netherlands, and it's a children's documentary it's called "Why Kids," and it's about human ri children's rights. And what could be good for you? They, these are fifteen to twenty minute documentaries, and I can bring you in contact with the Dutch public broadcaster. And maybe if you sometimes it helps that you first, if there's so much censorship within your country to see if we can broadcast and put it in our series in the Netherlands. And that also goes to the BBC most of the times to some Scandinavian countries, and that can bring pressure or something. So sometimes you have to find an U-Bocht, as we say, you know, you have to have a different curve in order to come back to your country. So just to jump in here, the, um, isn't the issue here though, <clears throat> the safety of the people involved in the story and the fact that the story gets out that they're going to be in danger, or there'll be there'll be uh, issues with their work if it's a surgeon. Um, isn't that the issue at the moment with this? Da, 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 da. Yes, da. yes, exactly. So, so is it a problem for the uh, for the filmmakers, or or problems for the the people that you're showing, for the people? Because the, 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 there's a 12-year-old child and the father is a surgeon who's helping out uh, with COVID. We have a very difficult situation where people can lose everything. It's one thing for me to, sac to risk my own 
uh, connections and family. But these are people who are uh, very honest, uh, who work with other people. You, you understand that these people are taking risk. And I wanted to invite the father to a press conference, but he asked me to not uh, bring out their, to not show their material beyond a narrow a network of people. So I would be very grateful uh, if there, if you have the, if there's a chance to show this movie to other people, which, because this film shows young people, uh, children who are as little as 10 years old, who give their view of what's happening in our country. Uno, I think uh, you wanted to add something. I saw that you raised your hand. Yeah, but it's not good news because I see this dilemma and it, it's a catch-22 and I don't know the, how to get out of it. The problem is that the intention of the general public here in Europe, for, for example, for Belarus, Belarus and the, the demonstrators is dramatically decreasing, which is a cynical effect, which I observed also in the Bosnian war and Chechen war. Unfortunately, even the most cruel and cynical atrocities lose uh, the power to interest people after a while people get used to it it's, it's awful but that's uh, the fact so the only chance i think to keep things alive would be of course to film in belarus more personal stories exactly this type of films like long-term observation take it out of this abstract pictures of people being beaten and people being tortured uh, on the other hand now comes what this lady said of course, that, that's super risky in the moment, and I wouldn't recommend anyone to, to feature as a hero in such a film. So that, that's what she describes, and, and that's the big, big drama. It's, it's not a good time for filmmaking in Belarus. So I just want to, to say, I feel helpless, frankly. As long as you don't get rid of this uh, dictator, it's going to be a difficult time for documentaries from Belarus. I think, especially if you remember at Marcia's uh, presentation, what she uh, gave us today, and uh, choosing your choosing your subject, we have a lot of things that uh, you can do, of course, during filmmaking. But if you are working in this kind of situation, it's very, very difficult to then really realize and to get it mm -hmm. get it out there. Marcia gave several examples uh, how in Holland you can get support. Uh, which I think is a, is a great opportunity, not only for your subject, but also for filmmakers in the other uh, countries that are listening to us, young filmmakers, young, young film students. Uh, I think it's uh, very important part. And uh, of course, we have always the question, uh, who is going to show it? And uh, how can we show awareness and raise awareness for what is happening in our countries? Um, and this is exactly the problem that right now uh, Udo addressed. Uh, that right now the attention, uh, unfortunately, is uh, decreasing. And therefore, it's even more important to make a difference and to try to get this film out there. Uh, and therefore, what uh, Machia called the doc community uh, is a very important help. Sometimes it's a festival, sometimes it's a broadcasters, sometimes it's a website that can be of help to get the story out. This morning, I started the uh, conversation, the chat, uh, when while we were rehearsing, uh, and checking the connections with the question, can we change the world? If we can, why is it so bad? But the answer is, my answer to this question is, if we do not do it, it would be much worse. So it's uh, uh, media. Media is not that journalism. Media is everything that gives information, including documentary films, including uh, uh, all visual and non-visual information carriers and channels. And it's up to us uh, to think positively and to continue uh, our efforts in changing this world. Thank you very much. I want to thank uh, once again, uh, Mike and Hubert for the support. Uh, thank you for enabling this. Uh, I hope next year it will be live and it will be a live stream. And uh, so we uh, can have it a little bit uh, better organized than in a, in a Zoom conference, uh, which you're probably all uh, tired of uh, by time for after this Corona time. Um, and I want to thank um, our panelists. Uh, thanks all three of you for being with us. Uh, and I hope 
to see many of you in the next year with your products. I really want to encourage all the students at these film schools, get in touch with us, show us your works that you're doing within the next year of studies. Um, do something about cultural diversity, send it in to the Adani Media Prize and maybe next year you will be on stage and invited to come to Tbilisi. This was a symposium, this was our uh, Adami talks for this year. Uh, so thank you very much and goodbye.